Luke chapter 10, they invite you to take your copy of the Word of God, Luke chapter 10, uh, continuing on, and we're in verse 17 today. Luke 10, 17, we saw last week how uh, Jesus had sent the uh, 70 out and he, he gave them an assignment, and uh, we learned, well, last two weeks we've been learning about that. So now they're returning, the 70 messengers of Jesus returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Lord, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see these things. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them. Hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. One of my guilty pleasures from coaching days, from my coaching days, was when we could beat a team that had previously dominated us. <clears throat> While I was coaching uh, King's Christian Academy soccer, the first time we went over to play the private school Calverton in Calvert County, they destroyed us. Remember, Connor? Like 7 nothing. It was, it, was it was a bad day for KCA. Uh, that's a ridiculous blowout for soccer to lose 7 nothing. Really humbling. But we got better. We competed very well against them. And we were quite even for a couple of years going back and forth. I got to know their coach. He was a really good guy. We had mutual respect for each other. But then there was this one year where the school went through a transition and that coach was gone and they had a new guy running the program and the team was seriously depleted in talent that year. And oh my, we destroyed them every time we played them. Just ran all over them. In one game, well, the score was getting out of hand and I thought, well, maybe, maybe we better lighten up a little bit. But then I remembered that first time we played, and I didn't feel so bad after all. To be honest, I quite relished the beatdown we were giving them. Because when you have been dominated, it is nice to get that boot off your neck and have the power. And in chapter 10, I think we see that kind of enthusiasm from the 70 messengers of Jesus when they come back and report, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That's pretty exciting to have victory over that powerful of an enemy. We saw in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent out his disciples and gave them power, uh, the 12 disciples, giving them power to heal sickness and to throw out, cast out demons. And even though in chapter 10, Jesus commanded the 70 to heal the sick, apparently casting out demons was also part of the assignment and the empowerment. As we have seen in Jesus' previous encounters with demons, demons tormented, tortured, and traumatized people. And now for the first time, men could dominate the demons. They could give them commands, and the demons were subject to them. They have power. And how did they have that power? From whence does it come? In your name. There's power in the name of Jesus. And Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, for this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of... Jesus, every knee will bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the name above all names. It's kind of comical this week, uh, reading some of the uh, Facebook comments on last week's sermon. People were arguing uh, about uh, how we, we said in the sermon, all, all, all that, uh, you know, talked about the false god and called him a demon. And people got a little upset saying, you know, all religions ought to be prayed for in Congress. That's disrespectful to call Brahma a demon. And I understand that point. 
you know, and I get what they're saying because we do have freedom of religion in our country and, and that's a value. We, we respect that. But at some point, we have to dispense with make-believe and be real. Like when you're playing tea party with a little child, right? Some of your children, they got little uh, kitchen sets. Who's got those little kitchen sets? There's one in the, in the nursery downstairs, right? And, you know, little, little ones will make you something to eat, and they bring it to you, and you go, yum, 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 yum. That is so good, yum, 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 right? And uh, it's fun. It's fun for the kids, and it's fun for you. But you don't take it seriously. You don't say, well, you know, I, I just uh, I was hanging out with uh, Hudson, and he made me made me uh, some food there on the place that I'm not going to be able to eat. Daniel, you would never say that to Montana, right? I can't eat tonight. No, you're, you're going to want the real meal, right? Uh, um, and the child, too, even though they're having fun playing make-believe, eventually they, too, want and need a real meal. The problem is, as I see it, America has played make-believe for so long, people don't know what's real anymore. Christians need to stop playing make-believe. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there's no such thing as an idol in the world, that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things, and we exist for Him and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we exist through Him. America is starving to death spiritually because people aren't having any real prayers. There's just a bunch of fake prayers to fake gods and fake spirituality being masqueraded by false teachers and a bunch of fake churches. And not a bit of wonder, we have a whole bunch of fake news and a failing educational system and unjust courts and everyone keeps believing the lies of these politicians falling for fake promises of greatness. Thomas said in Psalms 96, Therefore great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods for all gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in heavens and on the earth, yours is the dominion. Everything, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. And Jeremiah, you remember Jeremiah? Everybody memorized Jeremiah. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great. There's our standard for what's great. You are great. And great is your name in might. People are starving to death eating make-believe food. And at some point, someone has to stop playing games and be real. And feed everybody some real food. Say some real prayers in the name that has real power. As Peter preached at Pentecost, as he told the folks in Acts chapter 4, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Everyone needs to be saved. And the salvation is in one name. In one name only. So I'm sorry. I don't have time for make-believe. Demons are taking over on all fronts. The darkness is closing in. But we have the power over them. In the name of Jesus. This is a huge relief for the 70 that they have power over demons. To be honest, I see why they are excited. I think Jesus understands the reason for their enthusiasm, and he too rejoices greatly on their behalf, it says in verse 21. He rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit, and yet he doesn't want them to become enamored or overly focused on those victories. Rather, he points their attention to a far greater reason to rejoice. I wonder why. Let's see if we can answer that question this morning. As we think about these verses, Jesus said in response to them in verse 18, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this 
that your spirits are that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. There's a lot to unpack in that statement. We're not going to be able to cover it all this morning. Question though, why did Je- what did Jesus mean when he said, "I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven"? The guys are like coming back to Jesus and they're saying, you know, even demons are subject to your name. And Jesus' response is, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What what did he mean by that? Well, Jesus personally witnessed Satan being cast out of heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12 says, hopefully you can read that. I should have made a couple slides there. My bad. Do better next time. Isaiah 14, verse number 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations! For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pits. When did that happen? The fall of Satan that Jesus saw happened after Lucifer sinned, and this had to have been prior to Genesis chapter 3. So it was sometime creation, right? And Lucifer sinned, and before Genesis chapter 3, before Adam and Eve's temptation in the Garden of Eden. Matter of fact, Ezekiel 28, it says about Satan that you were in Eden, the Garden of God. So... That, that prophet testifies to the fact that Satan was the one, the serpent in the garden, uh, uh, tempting Adam and Eve. So at some point after creation, prior to the fall of man, Lucifer was cast out of heaven. The question no one can really answer is, how long was creation and mankind sinless before Adam and Eve sinned? And there's no way to be really dogmatic on this one. But an interesting theory is that Adam was 33 years old when he sinned. He lived in paradise 33 years, sinless. Why 33, Pastor Rob? Hmm. Well, the same age Jesus was when he died on the cross. The first Adam lived 33 years sinless and thus didn't need a sacrifice to atone for sin. But after he sinned, he died spiritually and now he needed the sacrifice. Jesus lived 33 sinless years and then was crucified. Jesus is called the second Adam. Adam. The first Adam brought sin into the world and death to all. The second Adam brought salvation into the world and the gift of eternal life. It would stand to reason that Jesus died for the sin of Adam at the very age that Adam committed it. That's a prophetic pattern. It's just a theory. I wouldn't write that into the doctoral statement of the church or anything, but you know, something to think about. But this statement, I saw Satan fall like lightning, is also evidence of Jesus' divinity. Jesus claims he is God. I and my Father are one, Jesus says. The New Testament declares that Jesus is God. I mean, that's just John chapter 1. That's always the one we go to to refute all the cults that say Jesus was a man and he wasn't God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and apart from Him was not anything made that was made. And then, who's the Word? Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. and We beheld His glory. And then the whole testament of John is the testament of Jesus Christ. He is the Word that became flesh. And we just got done celebrating that, right? At Christmas time, how Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us. God incarnate. God in meat. That's literally what the Latin means. In meat, in the flesh. Jesus was here with us. He's God. Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, speaks of his pre-existence. Jesus was there when Satan was cast out. He gave the order and he witnessed Satan fall. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, the Lord is speaking here, and the Lord takes credit for Satan being cast down. 
It says, and by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sin. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze upon you. So what does Jesus mean? I saw Satan fall like lightning. I take it very literally. He was given the 70 a history lesson so they could understand why they have power over demons in Jesus' name. Satan is a fallen foe and has always been subject to the authority of the Son of God. And this little history lesson helps them and it helps us too. How does it help us? Well, we see nowadays that people are trying to rewrite history, trying to erase it. They make false claims all the time, and that can be very frustrating for a lot of us. When people lie about us, or when they lie about what has happened, when they deny historical record, that's very discouraging and frustrating. But let me encourage you, let me encourage any who may be frustrated today, Thinking the liars are getting away from it. You might be thinking that justice is being destroyed and that the wicked are prevailing. Hear me on this one. Lies can't become truth just because they are spoken and accepted by the general population. Eventually, they will be exposed. Numbers chapter 32 as evidence of this. Be sure your sin will find you out. Jesus says in Luke, for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is any secret that will not be known and come to light. And then Ecclesiastes as a third witness to this fact, for God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ultimately, all the acts of men, listen to me now, are recorded in the books of heaven according to the Apostle John and what he witnessed in Revelation chapter 20. As he said in verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things that are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. So just remember that if you're getting distressed or or you're getting depressed thinking about the ungodly and the liars and the thieves and they're winning and getting away with murder, they might get the media to report their lies and they might censor social media and control the narrative right now, but they don't have access to the books in heaven and eventually they will stand before God and be judged out of what those books say. So you don't have to worry about justice or injustice. You just have to worry about yourself and how you will be judged. Satan will come at you with all kinds of lies, but just remind him and remind yourself of the facts. He was thrown down out of heaven one time, and one day he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, the devil who deceived them, he's deceiving a lot of people. This is the age of deception. This is how you know we're in the end times. There is an ongoing Spirit of deception going on. But the devil who received them was cast into the lake of fire, John says, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they are tormented night and day forever and ever. The same Jesus who tossed them out of heaven will condemn him to hell. And that same Jesus is who we believe in. It's who set us, sets us free from the power of Satan. It's Jesus who sets us free from death and from hell. Satan fell like lightning, Jesus said indicating that his judgment was swift and it was obvious and it will be again one day. Another bit of tidbit of information for you, lightning nowadays in culture is often used by Satanists as a symbol. So pay attention to symbols. Don't pretend they are meaningless when you see these symbols in and around pop culture. The upside down star as a pentagram also used by Satanists, used by uh, people with different occult uh, Isaiah t- 14, 12 tells you why they like to use the, the star as a symbol for Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the, mor- of the morning, son of the dawn. You were cut down to the earth, you who weaken the nations. So Satan is called a star. Sometimes 
I think the occult knows their Bible references better than some of us Christians and what they're presenting. So maybe that's a bit of homework for you. Go, go do some research and see who uses those type of symbolism in our culture. And then you'll know what demons they're worshiping. But Satan is fallen. He's cast down. He is a conquered adversary, according to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will injure you. Snakes and scorpions are poisonous, deadly creatures. They, they strike fear into the average person, right? There's nothing cuddly about that, right? You wouldn't give that to your, your, your loved one on Valentine's Day. Oh, look, I got you a scorpion, e, right? And snakes too, you know, snakes are poisonous and they're, they're dangerous. And, you know, the way they swallow animals whole is just really freaky. You ever see people when they have like, anacondas and stuff, and they're really big snakes, and I'm like, what are you doing? They just Boop. swallow you whole. Very unnerving. But these deadly menacing creatures have no power to hurt Jesus' messengers. You know, likewise, that snake is always a symbolic reference to Satan, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Satan's called the serpent of old in Revelation. We see in Revelation chapter 9 how the demon locusts have the characteristics of scorpions. So in the context here of Luke chapter 10, the 70s, ability to cast out G demons, Jesus' point is he gives them authority over all these things, sickness, creatures that could cause you physical harm, and even demons are all subject to Jesus' name, and so too is Satan. However, as the 70 are celebrating that the demons are subject to them, Jesus redirects their excitement and points to an even bigger blessing, their salvation. And Jesus says, do not rejoice that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Casting out demons has a temporary, limited benefit in this world. But having your name written in heaven has eternal, unlimited blessings. Our job is not Christians, brothers and sisters. Our job is not to be Keanu Reeves and Constantine. I like the movie. It's bad theology. You're not supposed to be fighting demons. Our goal is to get names written in the kingdom of heaven. Your name, your family's name, and anyone you can influence. Get those names, get those people, the hope of the gospel, so that they can have their names written in heaven. I want to show you a couple of visual aids this morning. Um, I, I earned two sporting awards in my life because I grew up in the era when you didn't get participation trophies. If you got anything, you actually had to earn it. So I had one in high school with my name on it, and all the years I've played, all the sports I've ever done, uh, I only ever got two awards. But this one was Athlete of the Year when I was in college my senior year. They gave me the official Athlete of the Year of the whole college. It's just it's a big moment. I thought you would applaud that. But that's okay. <laughs> Incidentally, the school went under. It doesn't exist anymore, so nobody gives a crap. <laughs> That's no big deal at all. I have, uh, and Garrett and Kylie have one of these now, a certificate of marriage. That was a big award, wasn't it? Wouldn't you say eliana has been the greatest award I've ever received in my life? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> this, uh, this was an ordination. Some fellas... And a church and, a, and an organization said, you should uh, be a minister a, of the gospel. And uh, men agreed and laid hands on me. That was a big deal. So that was an important thing in my life. You don't have to clap for all this. It's, I'm just, I'm, I'm building up to something, okay? I got, uh, got a couple of degrees, a Master of Arts, a Master of Divinity. Those are cool things. I received a, uh, a preaching award. I won an award for this. I, I, I put that on my resume, and Dick Neville is like, well, I hope you're good if you won that award. <laughs> and then I, I got a salutatorian award, and, and uh, be honest with you, the verdict's still out on the math on that one. I, I think that's still uh, up for grabs, if that was true. I think there were some voting machines or something in there that weren't working, right? Don't know. Now, this one, only a few of you have one of these, right? Some of you know what this is, most of you don't. This is a certificate of... Mem of, of National of, of Citizenship, a Certificate of Citizenship to this country, and this took 
many years to earn. It took visa after visa, landed immigrant status. It took thousands of dollars invested from Faith Bible Church that got me this and my family, and we all have one of these, and we keep it in a safe in our house because it is precious, and if we lost it, it would be bad for proof that we're supposed to be here, right? And they might kick us out. And, you know, as of last week, I don't know, they might anyways. But I wanted to show you that because we have great respect for this country. We wanted to be here, you know? I was born someplace else, and it was a, it was a goal to get here and to be here. And, and we, we took it as an answer of a prayer and a blessing to be in this country. So we have great respect, and we have great great uh, just appreciation to live in America. I've always, always admired this place. But all of these important landmarks, all of these events in my life that are very near and dear to me, the greatest thing I've ever done, I have no paperwork, I have no plaque, I have no certificate for. The most important event that ever happened in my life happened when I was six years old, the day I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me on my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And that day, my name was written down in glory and the white-robed angel sang the story of a sinner who has come home. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. Never more to roam. That is the most important event. That is the greatest accomplishment of my life. And that is what we ought to rejoice in. Everything else, marriage, occupations, citizenship, accomplishments, even the ministry. Oh, wow, I'm a pastor. Ooh, look at all the things we're doing around here. All that takes a back seat to having my name recorded in heaven. Paul put it this way in Philippians. He did the exact same thing in Philippians chapter 3. Ran a little history lesson for the folks. He said, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as a, to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I might gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to His death in order to attain the resurrection from the dead. And that is what we all need to be ready for, child of God. I don't know how much time we have left, but we need to all be prepared to count the costs of the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. In these last days, you have to be willing to count it all as loss in order to hang on to what is most important, your heavenly identity. Even in their victories and rejoicing, Jesus doesn't want them to lose a heavenly perspective. Now this next part here is, is, is kind of cool, and this is a good thought to end on. We see how Jesus was pleased with them, and I would even say he was proud of his messengers, and then he blesses them. Verse 21, he, at this time he spoke, this time he rejoiced greatly in the, in the Holy Spirit, and he said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and you've revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. You've hidden these things. Hidden what things? What's Jesus' point? Jesus' point is that these deep spiritual truths, this great authority, doesn't come to people with degrees and positions of prestige. But as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. 
God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame those who are strong. The base things of this world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are so that no man could boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus You became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Me personally, I'm so very grateful for that fact. I definitely am in the category of the foolish nobodies. And I'm glad that God has chosen me. And we have seen time and time again around here at Faith Bible Church, Jesus calling the broken and the damned and redeeming us, and calling us to serve for His glory and His goodness. And that is a reason to rejoice. He says, Yes, Father, for this way it is well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the the Son wills to reveal it. Think about this. He's talking there to his disciples, the 70, but he's also, when he says, and anyone to whom the Son will reveal him, that is us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you could pencil your name in there. And anyone, and Eric, and Bobby, and Bernard, the Son has revealed this to you. We who know God, we know who God it is. We know who God is because we are the ones who the Holy Spirit has revealed this great truth to. We have seen the glory of Jesus. We know His power, the salvation, and the hope that is in His great name. It was Jesus' will for me to know Him. And think about this. It was Jesus' will for you to be here today, to hear this message. It was His will to have this great truth revealed to you. There are no coincidences. God is sovereign. He brought you here today at this very time that we're doing Luke chapter 10 where God is giving this blessing to remind you who you are in Christ. And for those who have never believed this, for the first time, He wants you to know. He wants you to have your name written down in heaven. This is a tremendous blessing that is being offered right here, right now, to everyone who hears it. Turning to the disciples, he said, Blessed are the eyes which see these things. For I say to you, many prophets and kings wish to see these things that you see. They didn't see them. To hear the things which you hear, they didn't hear them. We did the blessing last week. It was wonderful. Here again, another blessing. Another blessing for you, church. We need it. I know there's people here today who are angry at God. They think that He's done things to shortchange them, to hurt them. You're angry that not everything in your life has turned out the way you wanted it. And I understand, but listen to me for a moment. That is true for everyone. Everyone in here is dealing with the hurt and the pain that inevitably comes from living in a broken world. Nobody's life is the way they want it to be. And here's why. This life is not the final destination. The here and now is not the final goal. The blessings of God surpass anything this world has to offer. Just we're, we're so in these last days in love with the world and the worldliness. It's all passing away. I'm getting old, eh? Almost 50. It's passing faster and faster every year. We see it slipping away. You know, I was saying to... I was saying to Kevin Hughes at the, at the wedding yesterday, is watching these babies get married, you know? And how long ago was that? I just got here, and Garrett was this little fellow running around, you know, crazy, crazy man. Boy, yeah, he was fun, you know, still is. You just should have seen him up here trying to do these vows, man. He's just doing that Garrett energy, dance and stuff. Probably he's going to fall right off the stage. I said, I said to Kevin, I went up to him in the, in the, I just like to creep people out and say stuff like this. I said, uh, coming quick, buddy. There's a little Alina out there running around on the floor, running around there playing with their friends. And I'm like, you're going to turn around and you're going to be giving that girl away before you. That's how quick life is. It's a vapor just like that. This is not the end. This is just something we're passing through. And there's hurt and there's pain and there's heartache as we go through it. 
but there's something far greater on the other side. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice that this revelation is offered to you today. Blessed are the eyes that see these things. Blessed are the ears that hear these things. Blessed is the soul that receives Jesus. You could have this blessing today, my friend. You could have your name written down in heaven. Let's bow in prayer. Maybe someone here today has not ever done that. All you have to do is say, Dear, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please write my name down. I want my name written in heaven. I want those blessings for all of eternity. He's not stingy with this. You don't get everything you want in this life, but he's not stingy with this eternal life. He wants all, whosoever will, may come. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. You can have that today. Lord, we just pray that you would remind the saints what you have in store for them. Those of us who are angry and frustrated and concerned about the world and what's happening and how it's all falling apart, help us to remember to not focus on this, but to rejoice our names are written in heaven. And someone here today, that they could have their name written in heaven. And all those books with all of the records of all the evil we did, that could be blotted out by your precious blood that washes us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us today, Lord Jesus, each and every heart, each and every one with their head bowed and their eyes closed, praying for healing and forgiveness. Cleanse us. Eliminate all of those bad deeds out of those books and put your righteousness upon us all and write some names down in heaven, we pray, for whoever it is, someone to pray. And we give you all the hope and all the grace and all the praise and all the honor and the glory. It's found in your holy name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,